Here comes DeMar. Yes, it's good! As DeRozan gets the Spurs lead! Oh, oh my goodness! DeMar DeRozan with a vicious slam! Oh no! It's to try to win it! Harden, no! Hurdle with a rejection! Last night it was the NBA suspending its season after Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz tested positive for the coronavirus. This hiatus will be at least 30 days. Black people have been shouldering this burden for 400 years. The only reason this nation has made the progress it has is because of the persistence and patience and effort of the black people. The NBA Board of Governors has approved a 22-team restart in Orlando, Florida at Disney World. How concerned are you about that, to be honest? I am. I don't, I don't want to die. It behooves each of us who might be a little bit older uh, to take it very seriously. I wear my mask in practice, and I only take it off when I got something to say. Welcome to the Hangtime Podcast. I'm your host, Seku Smith, here in Atlanta. We are pushing our way to the start of actual live NBA games, the NBA restart in the Orlando bubble. July 30th is when all the action kicks off. Day by day, we're taking you through the list of 22 teams, what to expect, what's to come. And today we're talking the San Antonio Spurs with my man, Michael Steve Wright from NBA.com. Mike, the Spurs are an interesting team in that nobody really knows what the expectations are. What do we make of what the Spurs are trying to get out of this? What's in store? What's on tap? And, and how they're approaching this whole process? Well, Seiku, I will tell you, my man, it, it is this is very much a transformative time period for the Spurs. And when you look at what they want to get accomplished out in Orlando, I'm not sure it's making it to that 23rd consecutive playoff appearance, which would be like a record, by the way. I'm not sure that's the case, though, because if that was the case, then they would not have let LaMarcus Aldridge undergo surgery in April on that shoulder. You know, you go into that Orlando bubble basically shorthanded. Your only proven scorer is DeMar DeRozan. You don't have uh, LaMarcus Aldridge. And he's, he's also huge in terms of what they do on defense. So I think what they want to do is get a lot of run for the young guys. Your DeJounte Murray's. Uh, Lonnie Walker the fourth, Derek White, uh, Keldon Johnson. They want those guys to – they want to see what they can do in, in, a, in a really competitive atmosphere like that. And, you know, I mean, they've been off three, four months or whatever. And so to thrust them into that type of competitive environment where it's almost, you know, do or die playoff, I think that's what the Spurs want to see, and I think that's what they want to get out of it. And more than anything, you know Pop, I know Pop. <laughs> yeah. What they want to get out of this is they, they want to keep the momentum and the conversation going towards the social injustice and, you know, racial inequalities, things like that. That's, I think, really the, the main goal for the Spurs. Pop, as always, no holes barred, you know, in terms of, of which topics he'll discuss. I'm, I'm wondering, does that overshadow what's going on with this team on the court in Orlando? The, you know, because every, every chance people get, they'll be coming to Pop for sound bites right. and asking him what his thoughts are. Um, do you think that becomes something that, that becomes bigger than whatever the Spurs are doing on the court? Honestly, say cool. I do believe it or not. I do. You know, when all, all of this stuff first started happening during this quarantine, I wrote a story about it, how the Spurs called together pretty much the whole organization. You know, they had like 400 people on the zoom call and they, they basically said, Hey, we, we are not getting off this call until we hear from everybody. This conversation lasted a few hours. And when they finally got off that call, they were surprised. They were blown away because, you know, yes, we're around black athletes all the time. And, and, and you know, we coach them and all that stuff. But we had no idea what everybody goes through. I mean, I was getting calls from people within the Spurs organization. And they were just like, I, I was blown away by the call. Like, I had no idea that these are the things that black people go through every day. And so I think, in a way, organizationally, they want it to be that. They want, they want the, the conversation to be that more so than about them trying to make this 23rd playoff appearance. So what do you do if you're DeMar DeRozan? You're, you know, you're a veteran player, a star player in this league, and you got to go down here and grind through these games against, you know, Sacramento, Memphis, Philly, Denver. You know, you got Utah twice, the Pelicans, the Rockets. I mean, what do you do if you're DeMar DeRozan, knowing you're going down there without that other guy who's on your level, you know, in LaMarcus, and you know that there's this kind of other thing hanging over the entire process, 
and you got young guys that you know the organization is trying to get a look at, and you're not signed up long term. If, if you're DeMar DeRozan, how do you approach how you carry yourself in Orlando in the bubble? For me, Seiko, if I'm DeMar, it's, it's an audition either one way or the other because, you know, he's got that option year. And I would be shocked if he did not opt in, given the uncertainty with the cap next season and stuff like that. So you, you've got that. And if you do decide to be a, become a free agent, well, wouldn't you want to show everybody what you got? But I also think that, you know, as the veteran leader for that team at this point, he's got to bring along those young guys. And, and, and just think about this. If, if you're DeMar and you go into that tournament, you into, that, into the bubble and have a great showing with all those young guys, then you're looking at the Spurs in a different light. Then you're saying, well, maybe we, we've got a little bit of a future here. Maybe this is where I need to be. For, for DeMar, I think it's important on a, on a lot of levels. But, you know, the, the main thing is he's going to have to lead those young guys. And, and I think for Pop, I think he wants to see that. He wants to see whether DeMar is capable of doing that. And, you know, he's shown that he's plenty capable from his time in, in Toronto. New team, new situation, a lot of younger guys. It's going to be important for him to be the man that he's been, you know, the, the leading scorer for the Spurs. But he's also got to bring along those young guys. I know it took Pop and LaMarcus some time to, to figure out how they would coexist in, in a, and operate at the highest level. Pop is a show me cat. He, he's not, you know, basing on what you've done in the past, what you did somewhere else. Is there still some kind of feeling out the vibe between the organization and DeMar, the way there was with LaMarcus when he first came? I definitely think that's the case because DeMar DeRozan is what DeMar DeRozan is. And that's not a knock on his game or anything like that. But if you remember back when LaMarcus Aldridge first came to San Antonio, Pop tried to change his game. He'll tell you to this day that he tried, he tried to make him Jack Sigma. And <laughs> it wasn't LaMarcus. Without the, without the curls, yes. Without the curls. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, but that wasn't LaMarcus. And then they had to sort of come to an agreement to, to let LaMarcus be LaMarcus. And Pop was actually grateful that it turned out that way. And I think that that's going to be the case with DeMar DeRozan because, you know, obviously DeMar is not a guy that, that's going to spread out defenses and stuff. You know, he's not a guy that's going to shoot a bunch of threes. I mean, you're lucky if you get one three out of, of him a game. And so, okay, that's not his game. So now you've got to figure out a way to build around that. And I think that's what's going to happen, especially if the Spurs decide that DeMar DeRozan is a part of the long term for the Spurs. So I'm interested to see what happens. You know, you live in San Antonio. You know how difficult it is for that organization to attract a certain kind of free agent to come there and, and be a part of what they're doing. Even given all that success they've had, right. it's still been a struggle to, you know, to get the big name marquee free agents. I don't know that it's impossible to find another guy as good as DeMar is right now at this point in his career. But I'm not sure that you have as easy a time attracting that guy in free agency as you did getting him in the deal for Kawhi, which was to me was a huge save by RC and Pop. Right, right, definitely. I mean, to get a guy of DeMar DeRozan's caliber, was that was the best that the Spurs could have done at that point. And you're totally correct about the inability to attract marquee free agents. I mean, think about it. LaMarcus Aldridge is the first one in recent memory for me, and that was in 2015. And, you know, obviously you know what the Spurs have done in the draft and, you know, how they can go get guys that – weren't necessarily marquee names and turn them into great players. You know, their development staff is just off the charts. And so that that's what the Spurs are going to have to rely on moving forward, the same thing that they've always relied on, and that's, you know, drafting the right guys and, and developing them. And, I mean, look at the, the upcoming draft. They've got their highest pick since Tim Duncan, man. So that, this, is their, this is going to be their highest pick in, what, 20, 23 years? So – I mean, there's a lot of promise with the young players that they have, and they've, they've done a great job of developing them. But, you know, you just don't know whether that is sustainable in today's NBA. Like, can you continue to do that? It's hard to do because everybody is on to the, the, the foreign players. All the NBA knows about foreign players now. I'm interested to see whether they can continue to uncover these, these late-round gems, and I know it's not going to be easy. I was so intrigued when I heard Pop talk about Patty Mills being the backbone of this team and being kind of the, basically the heart and soul of this team, which is when you think about where Patty Mills began with the Spurs and kind of what kind of footing he was on early in his career. And now, you know, he's the guy who, who Pop is talking about being the backbone of this group. That's, that's high praise. And, and if 
probably speaks to the work Patty Mills has put in, making himself kind of a mainstay on this group, you know, on this team and with this group. He's pledged to uh, to donate his entire salary for the remainder of the season to organizations tackling racial inequality and, and, and certainly putting himself into that same space we talked about, Pop, being in. Um, what do you expect out of Patty Mills on and off the court in the bubble? Well, on the court, he's going to be the leader. He's going to be the rah-rah guy. You know, you see Patty all the time swinging that towel and cheering on his teammates. And, you know, he's also going to be the guy that tries to calm people down, you know, because, like I said, it's going to be a lot of young players playing key roles in the bubble and once this NBA season restarts. And Patty's the guy that's going to have to calm them down. But they're also going to need his scoring as the, as the guy that leads that, that second group. Because, you know, really, if you look at it, he's sort of taking on that Manu Ginobili role with that second unit. He's got to be the guy that gets them going. And they're going to be they're going to play a different style of ball with that second unit, too. First unit will be half court, you know, slow it down, not much pace. But that second unit is like really frenetic. And they're going to throw up a lot of threes. And that's where, you know, Patty's going to be huge. And then off the court, man. Like, you ought to have – just sit down and have a, a conversation with Patty about, like, some of the, the racial things that go on in Australia. Yeah. He's opened the whole team's eyes to that. But he's going to be instrumental in sort of moving San Antonio's culture forward because, obviously, you know that, you know, for the Spurs, all this talks about social justice and racial inequality, things like that, that's nothing new for the Spurs. They've been doing that for over 20 years, ever since Pop has been there. You know, they bring guys like John Carlos to go talk to the team, you know, during training camp. Uh, I remember they went and screened uh, the 13 documentary. The whole team went and screened that. And, you know, I mean, I remember them. They they saw the premiere of Chirac. They went, Spike Lee personally invited them over. So that's what the Spurs do. That's their culture. But Patty, think about it. He's the longest tenured Spur at this point. And so he's the guy that moves that whole culture forward. And looking at Pop's history, obviously, he's been vocal and outspoken about this stuff long before this current movement, you know, got the energy that it did. So, I mean, it's, if nothing else, you know, Pop has been authentic and genuine in his thoughts about it. You brought up something so interesting, you know, about the, the playoff streak, Mike. And looking at Pop in the summary he had last year with, with Team USA, his first year, um, you know, as the head coach of that men's senior national team program. And I don't mean to, you know, say anything derogatory about Pop at all. This is this is just an observation. I wonder, 23 years, you know, this playoff streak, the time he's been like, all that he's gone through, you know, personally, off the court, um, you know, with his family the past few years. But I wonder how taxing the last few years have been on him. And if, if you're right, that maybe this is a, a year when you're not grinding and pushing Given the circumstances and the unprecedented nature of what's going to go on in Orlando, maybe you don't sweat everybody about the 23, you know, that, that number hanging out there in terms of the playoff streak. Well, Pop, tell, he'll tell you that they never talk about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's like, it's just the expectation that, you know, there's a, this expectation for the players to go in there and be prof- professionals and do their jobs. But at the same time, you know, he's not going to harp playoff, playoff, playoffs with them. And, you know, you look at Pop, you know, you were talking about, like, basically this whole situation just taxing him. You know what, though? Pop is is a grinder, man. Like, I think that this is what keeps him going. Because, you know, he's accomplished everything he need, he's he, that you'd want to accomplish in a basketball career as a coach. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And, and so what, what else is there left for him to do but to coach, you know, Team USA to a gold medal? That would be the last thing. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, being around the players, being around all the coaches and talking basketball, I think that's what just really keeps Pop's motor running. And I could see him just doing it until they tell him he's got to go. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Because now that I think about it, last summer when we were in L.A. watching Team USA, I was expecting him to show up and be kind of down. He, he was pumping everybody else up in the gym. I mean, he was juiced to be working with those guys and, uh, and getting them ready. Talking to San Antonio Spurs with Michael C. Wright from NBA.com. When we come back after the break, Mike, we got to break down some of the keys to the Magic Kingdom for the Spurs. They got a lot going on down there. Got some young guys, got some older guys. We'll find out what makes this team tick in the bubble.
Welcome back to the Hangtime Podcast, talking San Antonio Spurs with Michael C. Wright of NBA.com. And now that we're focused on the bubble in Orlando and all that's going to come with being on, on Disney property, we need some keys to the Magic Kingdom for the Spurs team. we we'll to go down there and figure out if the 23rd straight playoff appearance is in them or if something else might be in store. So, Mike, if, if there's one thing that they have to let go, from the regular season, if there's one trait, one tendency that this team has that cannot be a part of the process for them in Orlando, what is it? Their inconsistency on defense. First off, defense is the hallmark of everything San Antonio does. They feel like defense creates offense, but they were all, they were very inconsistent throughout the season. You know, some, some nights they could play with anybody. Some nights they'd get run out of the gym by, you know, some of the lesser teams. So they've just got to be a lot more consistent than they have been on defense. There's some beauty and beast matchups for every team in terms of the playoff competition. Who's the beauty matchup for the Spurs if they're to get into the playoffs? Woo! Say, I don't really see any, man, because... (laughs) You know what? Because they can't get in and Memphis get in at the same time. That's not going to happen. So, like, they would be a beauty matchup just because Memphis is a younger team just like them. But both those teams won't be in there at the same time, I don't think. So, man, the Rockets, just because of familiarity, Mm -hmm. you know, because they face the Rockets so much in the regular season, they face them in the playoffs. And then you go to, you know, when you look at the, the Russell Westbrook, you know, dynamic, They've matched up with Oklahoma City quite a bit and played against them in playoff series. So, you know, maybe Houston is just because of familiarity. And if you remember, was it the 2017 or 2018 Western Conference semis when the Spurs were guarding James Harden with their hands up? They were the first team to do it, and they were successful. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. That history with, with your in-state rival is one that I guess you could kind of drill down on. What would be the, the beast matchup? Who do they not want to see? in a playoff setting. Them Clippers, man. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want to see the Clippers because, first off, Kawhi, you know, Kawhi can say whatever he wants to, but every opportunity that he gets, he's going to try to, you know, show the Spurs, you know, I'm that guy. But it's not even that. I mean, you remember when DeJounte Murray, his first start came against the Rockets in the playoffs, that same playoff series I was talking about earlier. Right. And I remember Patrick Beverly would not even let him get the ball up the court <laughs> the first three times. I thought Pop was about to pull DeJounte out the game because he couldn't get it up the court because Pat yeah. was all over him. So that is the beast matchup. I don't think they want to see the Clippers. Yeah, I was going to say with the depth the Clippers have, a lot of teams don't want to see the Clippers. That's, they've been the pick for, for a lot of people, I'm sure. If you got three wishes, the genie shows up, pops out of that bottle on Grand Street wishes, what – Three wishes would you have for the Spurs in Orlando? Well, the first thing is that everybody comes back safely. Uh, The second thing is I would like to see the magic that Lonnie Walker possesses on a consistent basis. I I mean, this guy is electric. And a lot of people, I think this is the perfect setting to be, you know, the time when the whole world finds out about Lonnie Walker the fourth. Yeah, I remember against the Rockets in December, he went for like 17 straight points and brought brought the Spurs back to come back and beat the Rockets. That's my second wish. I think the third one is just that DeJounte Murray. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see him be the guy that the Spurs think he can be. And, you know, DeJounte has said in the past, I mean, just recently here during this whole coronavirus quarantine stuff, he said that, you know, they really haven't unleashed him yet. They haven't given him the green light to just do – do his thing. And this guy has so much talent. I'm, I'm talking like he's got the potential to be one of the best two-way guards in the entire league. I mean, the guy, he's long, he's athletic, can play some defense. You know, he's got to work on his shot a little bit, but I'd like to see him be the guy that the Spurs believe he can be. Yeah. Who's the Mr. Incredible for, for the Spurs in terms of a guy who steps up and ends up being kind of an X-factor game changer for him? Maybe Derek White. And go back. let's go back to last year in the playoffs when they played the Denver Nuggets. Derek White was like a revelation. The man went for like 30 on him in the playoffs. But, but the Nuggets did not see that coming. Derek White, was he was a revelation. And I think he can be the guy because he's, he's got so much talent defensively. You know, if, so if he, can, if he can do what he does on that end of the floor and then give him some offense, I think he can be that, that X-factor type of player. 
Yeah, you know, I just remembered I was there for that game when he went bananas on, on the Nuggets. Yeah. Derek White is a guy who I think is kind of overlooked if you think about that Spurs roster too. A lot of people forget how good he is on both ends and a guy that can facilitate and handle the ball as well. So right. um, very well could be that X-factor player. Now, since it's the happiest place on earth, they, they got to have a little bit of fun. Who on this Spurs team shows up with their golf clubs um, and hits the links a little bit in Orlando? Not a one of them. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, because, like, I, you think about all the, the, the weird hobbies that the Spurs have, and, and <laughs> I, I couldn't see a single one of them with, with the golf clubs. And I'm, I'm curious because, you know, there's rules where you can't really go off campus or anything. And so I'm wondering what the whole coffee gang, that's what they have with the Spurs. Right, right. You know, these guys love trying all types of different coffees from all over the world. And Patty Mills leads that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious to know how they're going to get their coffee fixed. They may have to import. Like, they may have to get some deliveries yeah. down there. Just don't cross the line. Yeah, yeah don't. don't do it. Who on the Spurs roster shows up to somebody else's game and turns into the obnoxious fan? The Spurs are so, like, choir boy type. I, you know, <laughs> it, it's, hard, it's hard to say. Maybe Patty. Because, you know, again, Patty's such a rah-rah guy. I mean, like, you, he could just put on the, the, the coyote suit and just be the <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. He's, he's that type of guy. He, che- he cheers to see him on quite a bit. So Patty would probably be that guy. Who do you think is most likely to be a closet Disney head that's going to show up and take advantage of all these roller coasters and water slides and all this other stuff you can get at Disney World? I honestly could see DeMar DeRozan being that guy. <laughs> Seriously. You know, well, DeMar, he's an interesting dude because he's really a homebody, doesn't do too much. But, you know, okay, if that's already your 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 MO, then when you get to Disney, what are you gonna do? I I don't I don't see him just sitting around reading books and watching Netflix like he claims he likes to do. As a matter of fact, I saw a video yesterday of him getting on one of those little bass boats to hit the water. Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm-hmm. it'll probably be him. What's the fairy tale ending for the Spurs? What could push them not only into the playoffs, but deep into it, possibly even to the conference finals and beyond? The fairy tale scenario would be that somehow they got a decent matchup in the first round, which I don't see because they've got to get that eight seed. And if they get that AC, you're looking at the Lakers or the Clippers, my man. <laughs> so, so if you got by one of those teams, to me, that's a fairy tale ending because you have no idea what can happen. Because And you've got a legitimate shot once you get out of that first round if you go from that eight C, you know, because you got to play the world. Right. So, yeah. yeah. But th- just making the playoffs for them is going would be a, a huge accomplishment because think about it. They, that last game before the, the hiatus – they played the Mavericks, they beat the Mavericks, and, you know, you were like, yeah, that was a pretty good win for the Spurs, but nobody was thinking, okay, now they're going to, you know, just go on a run and, and make it into that A spot for the playoffs. So, you know, I think that just making it to the playoffs for the 23rd consecutive year would be an accomplishment, and it would actually break the record. Like, right now, they're tied with 22 right. appearances. You know, with, without LaMarcus at full strength and with a roster of, of so many young guys getting cut, some of them getting their real – meaty experience you know in, in this kind of pressure packed environment it's going to be a, a tough call appreciate my man Michael C. Wright from NBA.com talking Spurs with us today check out every one of them every day leading up to the July 30 restart of this NBA season right here on the Hangtime Podcast <laughs> <laughs>